Well, it is an absolute joy uh, to be with you. Of course, there are just a few of us uh, here in the uh, auditorium, and uh, we enter, of course, once again, uh, uh, the strange moment of preaching to relatively empty rooms and auditoriums. And uh, we are mindful uh, here as we've been praying in the lead up to this conference, as Dr. Curry mentioned earlier, uh, we are mindful of uh, the toll uh, that these uh, days are taking on our congregations and not just on our congregations, but on ministers of the gospel. And uh, so it is our prayer uh, that uh, the ministers, uh, the future ministers uh, that are uh, tuning in to this uh, live stream uh, of this preachers and preaching conference, uh, that uh, you'd be encouraged uh, that the Lord would be the lifter of your head and would grant, grant, grant you great comfort and peace and, and uh, the strengthening of your soul as we consider uh, the life and ministry of Charles Simeon and as we uh, sit under lectures uh, about the preaching of the Word of God in the context of biblical and Reformed worship. Uh, Simeon's life and ministry uh, are in many ways a powerful a corrective to the ministerial wanderings and deficiencies of our own day. Uh, my hope is that as we consider his life, uh, we will learn many of these lessons for ourselves and be uh, reminded of many important principles in ministry, uh, particularly as it pertains to the primary task of every Christian minister, which is uh, the preaching of the Word of God. On Sunday, November the 13th, 1836, Charles Simeon departed this world and joined the church triumphant. The crucified and risen Christ that Simeon had personally cherished and publicly preached for over 54 years was now before his Lord in all of his resurrected glory. By God's grace, Simeon had entered his eternal rest. His funeral was a sight to behold. The dean of Carlisle commented that a Cambridge funeral of this sort, quote, was never seen or will ever be seen again. It was held in the historic King's College Chapel where enormous crowds gathered. We are told that over 1,500 gownsmen came to pay their respects. University lectures were suspended. Almost all professors and officials from the university were present. Shops were closed, even though it was market day. The bells of every college chapel, except one that was restricted for the royal family, sounded forth to honor this man. One of his biographers wrote that Simeon received, quote, a tribute the like of which has not been recorded of anyone else's funeral in Cambridge before or since. In his death, Simeon was loved and admired by many. But anyone who knows about his life is aware that this was not always the case. Indeed, it was quite the opposite. For decades, Simeon was the object of scorn and ridicule by students and colleagues alike. But through it all, through it all, this Cambridge preacher faithfully persevered in heralding the word of God for five and a half decades, preaching in season and out of season for the glory of God and the salvation of sinners. Though far from perfect, we have much to learn and be encouraged by from Simeon's life and ministry. Charles Simeon was born on September the 24th, 1759. He was born in the town of Reading, the son of a wealthy attorney. We don't know much about his early childhood, except that at the age of seven, his father dropped him off at the notable Eton boarding school where he would live and study for the next 12 years. In those years, Simeon would have been exposed to a kind of cold religious formalism. In later years, he wrote to the provost of Eton saying, quote, it is often with me a matter of regret that the atmosphere of Eden is so unfortunate for the health of the soul, and that scarcely the name of our blessed Savior is ever heard, end quote. Simeon also mentioned that if he had had a son, he would rather see him dead than to attend the Eden of his day. For it was a harsh, 
cramped, often unsupervised and ungodly environment. Since Simeon's family was not committed to Christ and his formative years at Eton appear to be totally devoid of biblical training and piety, it's no wonder that he found himself spiritually rudderless when he entered King's College, Cambridge, at the age of 19. Cambridge wasn't much different than Eton as it concerned the state of Christianity. Describing 18th century Cambridge, one writer comments that all that was to be seen was a cold and soulless formalism. Quote, the churches were rarely, if ever, full. The parishes were little visited by the pastors. And in the college chapels, the undergraduates behaved as in a playhouse, end quote. Indeed, it wasn't unusual for students to attend chapel inebriated. Cambridge, like the rest of England, was in dire need of reformation and revival in those days. It was in the context of this spiritual darkness that the light of the gospel would shine upon Charles Simeon, and he would meet his Savior. Just three days after Simeon arrived at King's, he and other new scholars were approached by the provost and told that it was compulsory for them to uh, attend communion. The Lord's Supper would take place in three weeks' time in the imposing King's Chapel, and they were required to attend. For those of you who know a little about Simeon, you know that it was during this period that he began to think seriously about uh, the condition of his own soul. In a private memoir written in 1813, Simeon wrote that, quote, on being informed that I must attend communion, the the thought rushed into my mind that Satan was as fit to attend communion as I was, and that if I must attend, I must prepare for my attendance there. But not really having any spiritual direction uh, from his upbringing or his primary school experience, he went out and bought the only religious book he had ever heard of entitled The Whole Duty of Man by William Law. It's not unlike uh, many who want to get uh, serious with their walk with the Lord and go into a Christian bookstore and, and buy the shiniest, most beautiful book they can find, and they read it and try to gain something from it. Well, he went to William Law and The Whole Duty of Man, but the volume was extremely moralistic and did not point Simeon to Christ at all. William Cooper uh, once commented that the book was a repository of self-righteous and pharisaical lumber. George Whitfield agreed. Uh, one time in, in Whitfield, one of Whitfield's orphanages, uh, a uh, young child, an orphan, was reading this book, and Whitfield ripped it out of the child's hands and threw it in the fire. Uh, uh, that was his thought of William Law's book. Nevertheless, Simeon read the book, prayed, fasted, and cried out to God for mercy. This first communion at King's passed, and Simeon was still plagued in his conscience and without peace. It wasn't until a couple of weeks before Easter communion that the light of the gospel began to break through. In order to prepare for the Lord's Supper, he again read a book. This time it was Bishop Thomas Wilson's book entitled, Instruction for the Lord's Supper. As it turned out, God used the biblical truth in this book to open Simeon's blind eyes. It was the doctrine of substitutionary atonement that made an unforgettable impression upon Simeon's soul. Simeon describes what happened in his own words. Quote, The thought rushed into my mind, What? May I transfer all my guilt to another? Has God provided an offering for me that I may lay my sins on his head? Then, God willing, I will not bear them on my own soul one moment longer. Accordingly, I sought to lay my sins upon the sacred head of Jesus. And on the Wednesday began to have hope of mercy. On the Thursday, that hope increased. On the Friday and Saturday, it became more strong. And on the Sunday morning, Easter day, April 4th, I awoke early with those words upon my heart and lips, Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From that hour, peace flowed in rich abundance into my soul. And at the Lord's table in our chapel, I had the sweetest access to God through my blessed Savior. By God's sovereign grace, Simeon was regenerated by the life-giving word and spirit. And his conversion was not without an abundance of immediate and lifelong fruit. 
It was not easy, however, being an evangelical Christian in late 19th century, uh, 18th century Cambridge. Uh, as mentioned before, there was a dearth of strong Christian preaching and fellowship in the land. And, and over the next three years at Cambridge, while full of love and zeal for the Lord, Simeon had hardly anyone that he could talk to about these things and enjoy fellowship with. It's really amazing to think of how God preserved Simeon in these years. To show how spiritually lean his context really was, just prior to his ordination, Simeon considered putting an advertisement in the local newspaper to announce that, quote, a young clergyman who felt himself an undone sinner and who looked alone to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and desired to live only to make him known was persuaded that there must be some persons in the world whose views and feelings accorded with his own and that if there were any minister of this description, he would gladly become his curate and serve him gratis, end quote. So Simeon entered the Christian ministry with great zeal and a great challenge in front of him. In 1782, Simeon graduated from Cambridge and was uh, awarded. Uh, uh, he was uh, awarded a, a living uh, and a fellowship, a stipend, and uh, he would have academic privileges and responsibilities with this position. He was also ordained uh, that year as a deacon in Ely Cathedral. Unclear as to where the Lord would have him serve, Simeon was called to minister at St. Edward's Church as an assistant curate during the summer months. This is the same church that the great Protestant reformer Hugh Latimer would preach in uh, back in 1529. It was not long before people took notice of Simeon's gifts, of his lively and faithful preaching. By the end of the summer, St. Edmund's was teeming with people on the Lord's Day. Henry Venn, another well-known preacher of the day, wrote to some friends that, quote, in less than 17 Sundays, Simeon filled the sanctuary with hearers, a thing unknown in nearly a century in that church. We learn of a humorous story that when the vicar of St. Edmund's returned from his summer holiday, uh, the clerk, uh, the one who took care of the grounds, uh, was irritated with all of the crowds of people. Uh, that were coming during that time. And when his vicar came back, he was relieved and he said, Oh, sir, I'm so glad that you have come home. Now we will have some room in the church. <laughs> Several years ago, uh, many years ago, uh, while uh, just starting out in pastoral ministry, my uh, uh, dear friend, uh, also who's been a mentor over the years, Dr. Derek Thomas, many of you will uh, know Derek or know of Derek, and um, I remember he came to preach in my congregation, and after he preached this wonderful sermon, as he uh, so faithfully does, uh, we were both receiving people uh, as they were coming out of the church. This is back in those days when people still shook hands and spoke with each other without masks on. You remember those days? And, uh, and people were, were coming out of the sanctuary, and this one lady, she gave great praise to, uh, uh, to Derek for his sermon and thanked God for him. And then, and then she, uh, she came to me and she said, Pastor John, uh, don't get me wrong, I really like your preaching, but man, I could listen to him all day. And uh, that's kind of a moment, I think, that uh, was taking place here in Cambridge. But the summer uh, ended and a new opportunity for Simeon emerged, an opportunity that Charles Simeon used to dream about during his uh, college days. There was a vacancy at the great Trinity Church in Cambridge. The former minister had died and would need to be replaced. Sometimes while walking past Trinity in his student days, Simeon would say to himself, quote, how should I rejoice if God were to give me that church that I might preach the gospel there and be a herald for him at the university? It was godly ambition that filled Simeon's heart. Through a small bit of political maneuvering, Simeon's father encouraged the bishop to appoint his son to the charge at Trinity. And seemingly without resistance, this young man who had been ordained only a few months earlier was appointed pastor at the great Trinity Church, an extraordinary work of providence considering the ministry that he had for the next 54 years. But Simeon was not well received by his new congregation. They were loyal to the then assistant curate, and felt strongly that he should have been given the position. 
But the bishop had made up his mind Simeon would stay. The willful church members would not take the decision lightly. They protested not only by skipping church, but also by locking their family pews so that nobody could sit down during the services. Those who attended the services had to stand or sit in the aisles. Uh, Once after Simeon had purchased chairs on his own dime, the church wardens threw the chairs out into the courtyard while cleaning the sanctuary. Believe it or not, this arrangement went on for no less than 10 years. I don't know about you pastors, but uh, when we're having problems in our church for 10 days, I sometimes lose my, my patience and I'm greatly discouraged. 10 years of this situation. In addition, the congregation uh, uh, chose the assistant curate, Mr. Hammond, to lead and teach in the afternoon service, uh, as it was called, or the afternoon lecture. Uh, It was their prerogative to do that. And so after five years, when Mr. Hammond was no longer taking the service, the congregation chose yet another person uh, to take that service, and this went on for seven more years. During this long period, Simeon, Simeon longed to have an evening worship service in order to preach God's word more than once on the Lord's Day. But knowing his intentions, the church wardens locked the doors so that the congregants congregants could not enter. During one of those episodes, Simeon actually hired a locksmith to come and to open the doors of the church so that people could enter, but that uh, would not go on. But it wasn't only his congregation that persecuted Simeon. The students and faculty alike were opposed to him early on. The students of Cambridge openly mocked him, slandered him, and once threw eggs in his face. The professors thought he was an enthusiast who wasn't to be taken seriously. Neither student nor professor wanted to be seen with him in public. And it was a few years later that Simeon mentioned in his diary that he was quite uh, uh, blessed and uh, surprised that a a professor of the university actually walked with him in public uh, on the campus. But through it all, Simeon persevered. When considering the poor spiritual condition of the Church of England in general, and at Cambridge in particular, where there was a famine of faithful preaching, Simeon knew that the ministry would not be easy. Many years later, he wrote about his challenging experiences in that first decade at Trinity. Quote, Simeon writes, In the state of things, I saw no remedy but faith and patience. The passage of Scripture which subdued and controlled my mind was this, 2 Timothy 2.24, The servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. It was painful indeed to see the church, with the exception of the aisles, almost forsaken. But I thought that if God would only give a double blessing to the congregation that did attend, there would on the whole be as much good done as if the congregation were doubled and the blessing limited to only half the amount. This comforted me many, many times when without such reflection I should have sunk under my burden. Well, those of you who are preachers of the gospel future preachers of the gospel. Did you notice Simeon's twofold remedy of faith and patience in the midst of his trials? Faith in Christ's promise to build his church through his all-sufficient word and patience to wait upon the Lord as he worked according to his own perfect timing. This is a big encouragement to those of us who may be going through a gloomy time in ministry. It's an encouragement not to allow our thorny circumstances, like the ones, for instance, that we are presently dealing with in our cultural moment. It's an encouragement not to allow our thorny circumstances to take our chief attention and affections away from Christ and his gospel promises. It's a reminder to earnestly labor for the smile of God with a thankful heart and to patiently entrust the results of our ministry to him. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. 
Despite all the hardship that arose from inside his own congregation and outside in the university setting, with the attendance not being very strong after seven full years of labor, Simeon was not paralyzed in ministry. He was not sitting back with self-pity. On the contrary, he was exceedingly busy. He was preaching and visiting the people and inviting students into his spacious residence at King's. Because the Church of England at that time did not have any substantial homiletics training for ordinance, Simeon took it upon himself to conduct what he called preaching classes in his residence for those who would be interested. These classes began in the year 1792, and before long, 15 to 20 students began to show up every other week to learn from Simeon. These preaching classes, which, now get this, lasted for over 40 years, dealt primarily with techniques of preaching and sermon construction. In addition to these preaching classes, Simeon began in 1813 what he called conversation parties. These were for students on Friday evenings. These conversation parties were meant for discussing doctrine and preaching and many other appropriate subjects. An average of 60 to 80 students would regularly attend these meetings. Simeon loved to be with the students, to have informal fellowship around God's word. He would fondly refer to these little meetings as a, quote, foretaste of heaven. As the years passed, Simeon's influence grew. More and more people were attending Trinity Church, half of which were Cambridge undergraduates. After three successful deanships, totaling nine years and one term as vice provost, he gained respect from many officials at the university. Simeon's ministry was primarily in Cambridge, but his influence didn't stop there. The Cambridge preacher had a heart for the world, especially for the nation of India. He called his labor on behalf of India an incessant object of my care and labor. He affectionately called India his diocese. For 40 years, Simeon sent a steady stream of young men to India to serve as missionary chaplains with the East India Company. Among those whom he sent to South Asia was the notable Henry Martin, who served for two years as a curate under Simeon at Cambridge and and went on to India to translate the New Testament into Urdu and Persian and Arabic. In addition to Simeon's focus on India, he was heavily involved with the mission to the Jews and the British Foreign Bible Society at profound personal expense. He received a large inheritance from his family and used that uh, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Despite being busy with students, ordinance, prolific letter writing, missionary societies, ministry trips to Scotland, and periodic academic responsibilities at the university, Simeon was first and foremost a preacher of the word of God. Like our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles, Simeon never swerved from his primary task of preaching. No one who knew Simeon would have disputed the fact that it was to the proclamation of God's word that Simeon gave his greatest energy. In fact, for the first 24 years of his ministry, he never took a Sunday off. I don't know why I'm saying that publicly. I've been wanting to shield that from my elders. Uh, uh, 24 years without a Sunday off. Throughout his ministry, he dedicated an average of 12 hours of preparation for every sermon. He preached his text in an expository manner. That is, he preached what was in the text, what was before him. Even though he didn't preach in the Lectio Continua uh, model, uh, that is, uh, straight through books of the Bible, as some like myself would have preferred, his preaching was thoroughgoingly biblical. Indeed, he advised those in his preaching classes to give every text, quote, its just meaning, its natural bearing, and its legitimate use to ascertain from the original and from the context the true faithful and primary meaning of every text. Oh, that we would hear preaching like that in our own day, where we get the true, faithful, and primary meaning of every text. He also wrote, quote, My endeavor is to bring out of Scripture what is there and not to thrust in what I think might be there. In other words, his aim was exegesis, 
and not eisegesis. He viewed himself as a servant of the text, not the text as his servant. In Simeon's day, as in our own, the pulpit was too often being used to feature the eloquence or charm or creativity or political persuasion of the minister and not the simple explanation and application of the word of God. Simeon not only modeled a commitment to exegetical preaching in his pulpit, he also sought to help others to do it as well through his famous sermon outlines or skeletons. After reading an essay on sermon composition by Jean-Claude, a 17th century French Huguenot reformer, Simeon decided to republish Claude's essay with his own editorial comments and 100 of his own sermon outlines, demonstrating to ministers how it's done. He did this in 1796. This was published in 12 years after he had preached his first sermon at Trinity. Five years later, in 1801, Simeon's outlines had grown to 500. These five volumes were published, amazingly enough, by Cambridge University Press under the name Helps to Composition. Eighteen years later, in 1819, he published no less than 17 volumes of sermon skeletons, as he liked to refer to them, and he, and he called this set Hora Homiletica. In 1832, more volumes were added so that every passage of the Word of God was covered. 2,536 sermon outlines in 21 volumes. After it was published, Simeon was invited to King William IV's court in order to present a copy of the series to him. And he also gave a set to every archbishop and sent a set to every major library in Europe and America. He hoped that this set of sermon outlines would help ordinance and ministers in Britain and around the world to preach sermons that were faithful to the meaning, sense, and application of the text. Simeon wrote this, quote, If it leads the ignorant to preach the truth, and the indolent or lazy to exert themselves, and the weak to attain the facility for writing their own, and the busy and laborious to do more and with better effect than they otherwise could have done, I shall be richly repaid for my labor." Dear pastors, the heart of Simeon's preaching was to get at the heart of the truth that was before him. He was not interested primarily in promoting and defending theological systems, but rather in preaching Christ crucified from the passage that was in front of him. Gleaning much from Claude's essay, Simeon taught that the anatomy of a sermon is threefold. And we're going to see that uh, Simeon loved to deal with things in threes. Here, he, he shows us the anatomy of a sermon in this threefold way. First of all, there is the introduction, then the discussion, then the conclusion. The introduction. Uh, this introduction, he says, shouldn't be too long, it shouldn't be too intense, and it shouldn't be boring. Isn't it awful when you hear the introduction to a sermon and you're bored in the first two minutes? That should never be the case. Our introduction introduction should engage the hearers, bring them in, ask those rhetorical questions that have meaning beyond what people are reading on their social media accounts and seeing on cable television. It should be a clear bridge to the text, the introduction should be. It's meant to connect the hearers to the text and help them see why they should listen to the rest of the sermon. How about the discussion? Secondly, this is the explication, observation, of the text, uh, propositions that are made, applications throughout. We don't preach an entire sermon uh, uh, and then get to the application right at the end. Uh, Good preaching has application all throughout uh, the sermon so that people are engaged in recognizing this is not just a, a, a theoretical kind of classroom lecture. It's that which is to be preached to the soul. It's for our hearts and our souls and our faith. Thirdly, there's the conclusion This conclusion, he says, should be lively, zealous, animating, uh, passionately pressing the truth into the hearts of our hearers. Uh, Not that other parts shouldn't uh, possess these qualities, but there's a sense of the seriousness of the application that should be there in the conclusion that this really matters for our lives. In addition to Simeon's threefold division of the sermon, he also had a threefold aim. And this has become somewhat popular. If you've read Simeon, you'll know 
this threefold aim of preaching, and I love this, and every pastor, please listen up, write this down. The threefold aim should be to humble the sinner, to exalt the Savior, and to promote holiness. To humble the sinner, to exalt the Savior, and to promote holiness. There you have law, gospel, and the motivation of holiness, to live a holy life motivated by gratitude and a clear preaching of the third use of the law. As I thought about Simeon's three aims, it occurred to me that much Reformed preaching today uh, does an adequate job on points one and two to humble the sinner and to exalt the Savior. But we do a fairly poor job on point three, promoting Christian holiness. We're quite eager to sound forth the indicatives of Scripture, but timid when it comes to preaching the imperatives of Scripture. We are called, dear pastors, to teach people how to live the Christian life. And we do that not based upon our own opinions, but upon the Word of God. The Word of God teaches us how to live the Christian life in grateful, growing obedience in response to the gospel. Our preaching, as Simeon asserts, must promote Christian holiness. It must be uh, calling us to conformity to God's Word. It must apply to the consciences of men and women, the commands of Scripture, not in order to gain acceptance with God, but because by His sovereign grace in Christ Jesus, we have already been accepted by Him and are called to live as redeemed children, to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. And in view of the mercies of God, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Paul, writing to Titus, declared that Christ, quote, gave Himself for us, to redeem us, now hear this, from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, Titus 2.14. In the first chapter of Peter, we read, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." Of course, our confession reinforces this, the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, chapter 19 of the Law of God, quote, although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works to be thereby justified or condemned, yet is the law of great use to them as well as to others in that as a rule of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly. And what follows in paragraph 6 of this chapter is very important for our own modern-day context, where some seem to be under the impression that the free gospel is compromised if we earnestly preach imperatives from the Word of God. Funny enough, the Apostle Paul does in every one of his epistles. He preaches the indicatives, pointing us to Christ and salvation in Him, that nothing is to be added, and then shows us how we are to live the Christian life in growing grateful obedience. Listen to what uh, chapter or paragraph 7 says. Neither are the forementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel, but do sweetly comply with it, the Spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. Oh God, you have saved me. You have given me a new heart. You have given me a new perspective. Everything is different. You've saved me. You've brought me into union with Christ. Now, now what? Well, the word of God tells us, now live a holy life and grateful, growing. Let gratefulness be that chief motivation. Gratefulness for God. We're not earning anything. We are living in grateful response to all that Christ has done for us. Now, I mentioned earlier that Simeon liked to work in threes. In addition to his threefold division and threefold aim, he taught that faithful preaching will instruct, please, and affect. Instruct, please, or comfort, and affect. 
In other words, preaching should have a clear pedagogical element to it. God's people should be growing in their knowledge and understanding of the Bible through preaching. But it's not to be solely an intellectual exercise, like a dispassionate, detached, and formal classroom lecture, which, by the way, I've heard a lot of preaching over the years that's like that. Uh, and it is, it is sort of soulless formalism, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, no, we are not to hear lectures uh, from the pulpit. It's to be, it's, the sermon is to be delivered in such a manner so as to comfort and to move the hearts of God's people. Jean-Claude wrote that, quote, the understanding must be informed, but in a manner that affects the heart, either to comfort the hearers or to excite them to acts of piety, repentance, or holiness. When it comes to instruction, most Reformed and Presbyterian preachers would score pretty high, I think. Regarding comfort, most of us would receive decent marks, but when it comes to effect, A-F-F-E-C-T, effect, the scores may be lower. Listen to what Simeon says here, quote, It's easy for a minister to prate in a pulpit and even to speak much matter, much good matter. But to preach is not easy. To carry his congregation on his shoulders, as it were, to heaven. To weep over them, pray for them, deliver the truth with a weeping, praying heart, end quote. This is not teaching us, of course, that we ought to get overly emotional every time we step into the pulpit, that there's a, a moment in the sermon where you know the pastor is going to cry. No, that's not what he's saying at all. The point is that our preaching should reflect a sincere zeal for the lost, an authentic love for the flock that God has placed under our care, a genuine passion for Christ and for his word. If preaching rarely moves the hearers, Perhaps it's because the preacher himself is unmoved by that which he is preaching. May it not be so. Simeon wrote this, quote, Do not preach what you do not feel. Seek to feel deeply in your own, uh, to seek to feel deeply your own sins, and then you will preach earnestly, preaching to fellow sinners. Are the days of powerful, evangelical, and reformed preaching over? Are we simply going to hanker for the good old days? Do preachers no longer have good news that moves them to plead ardently with their hearers? J.I. Packer says this, What troubles us, I think, is the sense that the old evangelical tradition of power preaching The tradition in England of Whitfield and Wesley, Simeon and Ryle, has petered out, and we do not know how to revive it. We feel that despite all our efforts, we as preachers are failing to speak adequately to men's souls, end quote. It's recorded that once when Simeon was preaching, a little girl leaned over to her mother and said, what is that man in such a tizzy about? We need more preaching like that. We also learn that one day when Simeon was preaching in Edinburgh, Scotland, he just finished his sermon and uh, he thought the flowery organ piece after the service was distracting the congregation. And so he cried out, stop the organ and think on the covenant. William Carus, Simeon's curate and successor, explains why people would have had strong reactions to his preaching because, quote, His whole soul was in his subject, and he spoke and acted as he felt, end quote. Of course, again, this is not an encouragement to manipulative, emotionalistic preaching, but it's an exhortation to preach with feeling. After studying Simeon's life and preaching many years ago, it is a regular prayer of mine on the Lord's Day morning before going into the pulpit, Lord, help me to feel deeply that which I am about to communicate because these are the eternal things. With all the headlines on Fox News and CNN and in the newspapers, this is the most consequential thing that's happening in the world. The proclamation of the gospel, of the kingdom of God. This is an exhortation to preach with feeling, to pray that the Spirit of God provides us with unction as we trumpet forth 
God's truth. A final threefold directive for preaching that Simeon gave is that in our sermons, there should be a unity in the design, perspicuity in the arrangement, and simplicity in the diction. Unity in the design is to be focused. It shouldn't be scattered and on 10 different subjects. Perspicuity in the arrangement. Uh, There should be a clear outline. Uh, It should be set forth so God's people can follow along. Thirdly, simplicity in the diction. Our, our choice of words shouldn't be over the heads of our hearers. We don't want to try to impress them with our learning, but help them to understand what God's word is saying. Simeon did not preach politics, even though he had close friends like William Wilberforce. Simeon did not approve of informal chattiness or silliness in the pulpit, even though he ministered in a college town where half of his congregation were undergraduate students. Simeon deplored moralistic preaching, even though there was so much of it going on in his own day. No, Simeon preached the glory of God and the saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached the word. And we desperately need to recover this kind of preaching in our own day. Courageous preaching. Preaching that has a sense of gravitas because of the great God whom we are preached. Wasn't it David Wells who said many years ago that the problem with the modern church is that God is resting lightly upon it. There's not that sense of gravitas that we are gathering in the presence of God and hearing God's word to us from the pulpit. And there's a sense of of, of of stillness, a a holy hush over the congregation as God speaks to his people through the preaching and the reading of the word of God in the context of public worship. We desperately need to recover this kind of preaching. We are so busy trying to make everybody feel comfortable that people are feeling comfortable in going to hell without the gospel. Our unoffensive version of the gospel. Once again, Packer comments, this is an age of great thoughts of man and small sentimental thoughts of God. Within evangelical Christendom, hardly less than outside it. Simeon would tell us, Packer writes, that we have things topsy-turvy, nor can we expect God to honor our preaching unless we honor him by giving him his rightful place in the center of our message. Imagine that. Preaching out of God's word, where the very center of his word from Genesis to Revelation is the person and finished work of Jesus Christ, and we do not preach him. He goes on, by giving him his rightful place in the center of our message and by reducing man to what he really is, a helpless, worthless rebel creature saved only by a miracle of omnipotent holy love and saved not for his own sake, but for the praise of his Savior. Well, there's no doubt that Simeon was a great preacher, but he also had a lot of odd quirks and eccentricities and idiosyncrasies. A perhaps lifelong singleness allowed for those idiosyncratic behaviors to go relatively unchecked. A, a, an apology for those who are single and listening to this and who are perhaps an older single person. Uh, As those who are married know, a loving uh, wife will always help point out those quirky behaviors that we need to uh, remove from our lives. Simeon was not described as a physically attractive person. His friends in grade school named him Chin Simeon because of his pointy chin. You can see his defined chin in the famous silhouettes that were done of him. Perhaps the combination of his less than arresting appearance and his large pocketbook Uh, inspired his interest in fine apparel. Uh, He dressed like a country gentleman, not unlike John Owen, who had quite a taste for fashion. He's also reported to have had a quick temper over mere trifles, getting easily irritated even at the little things when not done properly. Perhaps his struggle uh, with his painful condition of gout caused some irritability. He also tended to be uh, oversensitive in his friendships. Uh, When he didn't get a letter back right away, he wondered if he had offended a friend and was always worried about those kinds of things. But despite all of these quirks and weaknesses, God chose Simeon to make an impact, a powerful impact on a generation of preachers and students and lay people all over the world. 
In the fall of 1836, when Simeon was in his final days, there was a crowd of curates, nurses, and servants gathering around him. Not approving of those sentimental deathbed scenes that became a regular part of Christian biography, Simeon cried out, quote, You are all on a wrong scent and are all in a wrong spirit. You want to see what is called a dying scene. That I abhor from my inmost soul. I wish to be alone with my God and to lie before him as a poor, wretched, hell-deserving sinner. But I would also look to him as my all-forgiving God. Don't let people come around to get up a scene here. Only days later, Simeon breathed his last. His body was interred in King's College Chapel, the same place that God had gloriously saved him in his first year of university. All that may be seen where he is laid to rest are his initials, C.S. And the year of his death, 1836. Well, a memorial plaque was placed in the church where he had preached for 54 years. It read, and it reads this way, In memory of the Reverend Charles Simeon, M.A., senior fellow of King's College and 54 years vicar of this parish, who, whether as the ground of his own hopes or as the subject of all of his ministrations, determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want to bring this lecture to a close by setting forth very quickly five lessons that we can take away from his life and ministry. Five lessons that will challenge us in our own churches. First of all, first of all, amidst the thorny, dark, and challenging times of ministry, be a faithful shepherd to Christ's flock. Amidst the thorny, dark, and challenging times of ministry, be a faithful shepherd to Christ's flock. We learn this principle from his life. Simeon had no real peace in his congregation, he says, for 30 years. 30 years. But this did not hinder him from patiently loving his people and unswervingly preaching God's word Lord's Day after Lord's Day. And can we just say, if we trust the Lord, if we know he's our Father, that he's working all things together for our salvation as as uh, Romans 8 says in Heidelberg, question, answer one, then we will believe that the very challenges and difficulties in our lives are put there by God to protect us from ourselves, to make us more dependent upon the Lord in prayer. God brings these difficulties into our lives and ordains these thorny things in our lives to make us more dependent upon him. And we all need that. Six months into my church plant in Charleston, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. My first thought was, really, Lord, this is, this is uh, going to be helpful to this process? <laughs> but it was exactly what needed to happen. The Lord humbled me, put me on my knees, and gave me a whole new perspective in life of gratitude and service and love. Now I truly consider every day a blessing and a gift from the Lord, an opportunity Like I didn't before, hearing those terrible words, you have cancer. This is what the Lord does. He brings these things into our lives to humble us. And so we ought to respond to these things by being faithful, by his grace. All of these challenges in these 30 years did not hinder Simeon from loving his people and unswervingly preaching the word. Later in his ministry, when asked about how he persevered through these difficult times, he said the following, quote, My dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I am getting through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are safely through, I can bear the pricking of my legs. Let us rejoice in the remembrance that our holy head has surmounted all his suffering and triumphed over death. Let us follow him patiently. We shall soon be partakers of his victory. Pastors, whatever God in his providence brings our way, let us not shrink back from preaching the whole counsel of God in season and out of season. That is when it's well-received and when it's not, when it's convenient and when it's not, when it's bearing visible fruit, when it's not, when the auditoriums and sanctuaries are empty and we're looking at cameras and when things are back to normal. Secondly, as a minister, consistently cultivate personal biblical piety. As a minister, consistently cultivate personal biblical piety. I think that there is a lack of emphasis on this today. 
Ministers are focusing more on Christian liberty than Christian piety, often to a sinful extreme and not on not the focus on personal holiness and being a godly example to the flock. Simeon was up before dark every day spending time with God in prayer and Bible reading. He knew that if he did not take care of his own soul, that he would not be able to properly lead, shepherd, and feed his own flock. In a letter written to Simeon in 1782, just after he received his call to Trinity, he was exhorted to watch over his own soul. Quote, I should recommend you having a watch, excuse me, a watching eye over yourself. For generally speaking, as is the minister, so are the people. If the minister is enlightened, lively, and vigorous, his word will come with power upon many and make them so. If he is formal, the infection will spread among his hearers. If he is lifeless, spiritual death will be visible through the greatest part of the congregation. Therefore, if you watch over your own soul, you may depend upon it. Your people will keep up pace with you generally, or at least that is the way to blessing. End quote. Simeon believed that a profound part of walking with God was cultivating true humility. He said that if there are three lessons every minister should learn, it should be these. Humility, humility, humility. He felt strongly that a minister should not be self-promoting, but self-deprecating. Not self-exalting, but self-loathing. He believed that downward was upward in the Christian life, especially for the minister. Simeon once commented that he had in his life, quote, labored incessantly to cultivate the deepest humiliation before God. We are being told in our day, where everything is so therapeutically driven, that that is a negative thing. Don't be a negative Ned or Nelly, right? Be positive. Well, this is having a right view of ourselves before God. In our age of blogs, Twitters, social media accounts, scores of publishing outlets and personal websites, self-promotion seems to have become an acceptable pastime for ministers. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. All of us ought to follow the lead of John the Baptist when he said, may he increase and may I decrease. The ministry is not about us. Young pastor, the ministry is not about you. Young seminary student, the ministry will not be about you. It's about the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. It's about our blessed triune God. People should never be confused about this in our ministries. And if they are, you need to warmly but firmly correct them, that the focus is not on us, it's on the Lord. Thirdly, let us not neglect the global missionary task because of our busyness in our own congregations and communities. Simeon was a busy man. There were 1,100 people attending his church. He had curates to look after, tons of students vying for his time, university responsibilities, and on and on we could go, but we have learned he did not forget the missionary task even when missions was never more challenging and dangerous. Listen to this. In uh, in preaching uh, a sermon on June 8th, 1802, Simeon said this, quote, It may be said, perhaps, why are we to waste our strength upon the heathen? Is there not scope for the labors of all at home? I answer, it is well for us that the apostles did not argue thus. For if they had not turned to the Gentiles till there remained no unconverted Jews, the very name of Christ would probably long since have been forgotten amongst men. Besides, the more our love abounds toward the heathen, the more will the zeal of others be provoked for the salvation of our neighbors, and the more confidently may we hope for the blessing of God upon their pious endeavors. Let then all excuses be put away, and let all exert themselves, at least in prayer, to the great Lord of the harvest." and entreat him day and night to send forth laborers into his harvest. Fellow pastors, future pastors, let us not forget about the missionary task in the midst of our busy local ministries. Fourthly, let us invest in the next generation of ministers. As we've seen, Simeon was relentless in the time he spent with ordinance. He trained them. He spent informal time with them to encourage them. We need to make this a priority. We need to mentor the next generation. And so, dear pastor, whether you are in a large church or a small church, 
Find a few men to take under your wing and to encourage them and to walk with them through life. Finally, finally, we learn this lesson. Never, never negotiate the primacy of preaching. Never negotiate the primacy of preaching. I hope that's one thing you'll take away from this conference uh, today. Many will seek to convince you that if there's any hope for the church, that you must look to other means, that preaching simply will not do. But Christ has promised to build his church through the heralding of his word. He is pleased through the message preached to save those who believe. Like the early church, it is to the apostles' teaching to which we must be devoted. So let us, like Simeon, take heed the words of Paul in his final Letter to Timothy, quote, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. These were Paul's final words to his disciple. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Well, there's so much more we could consider as it concerns the life and ministry of Charles Simeon. My prayer is that what we have touched upon would be an encouragement to us to learn from his example and by God's grace and strength to reflect some of the same biblical qualities that he did, not least in a proper view of ourselves as vile sinners and of Christ as a great and glorious Savior and of the means of the preaching of the word of God that he himself, our crucified, resurrected, exalted Savior, who is coming again, that he himself instituted for the salvation of his church, the preaching of the word of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the life of Charles Simeon. Lord, we are indebted to you for his example, for you know you worked in his life. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise up godly preachers, that you would renew the hearts of godly preachers, to preach the word in season and out of season, when it is hard and when it is easy, when it is convenient and when it is terribly inconvenient. And we ask, Lord, that you, by your grace, would be the lifter of our heads and that we would persevere. Lord, be with those pastors who are on the edge, on the edge of giving up. Grant them grace to persevere, to continue opening their Bibles and preparing and studying and preaching your word, boldness and courage, preaching Christ from all of Scripture. And may you receive all the glory in Jesus' name.